Good morning, um, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are uh, joining us from today. Um, welcome to our first event in the VP EDI Distinguished uh, Speaker Series. Um, and speaking of um, distinguished, we are thrilled to be kicking off um, this uh, series with no other than Professor George Safadeh, one of the leading Canadian scholars on race and race studies uh, in Canada. Um, Prof is actually joining us from Ghana, um, his native Ghana uh, today. We are uh, so happy um, that he's here. Uh, I'd, I'd like to point out too that um, today is actually Human Rights Day. And you, you probably won't believe this, but we didn't actually plan it this way. Um, so I think the stars are aligning um, that we have um, our Prof uh, Nana today um, speaking on Human Rights Day. Um, welcome, Nana. Uh, this is a treat, uh, folks. So enjoy. It's my pleasure uh, to welcome you uh, to this event. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you two of our young, bright talent at the University of Windsor, um, Aisha Mian Akram, uh, who is a PhD student in sociology here at the university, and Miriam Tolson Murty, who is also a PhD student in the Faculty of Education but also wears the hat of Director of Anti-Racism Organizational Change at the University. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Aisha and Miriam, who are going to be our moderators uh, today. Enjoy the show. Thank you, Dr. Beckford. Uh, welcome, everyone. I would like to get things started with our land acknowledgement. Uh, the University of Windsor sits on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confeder Confederacy of the First Nations, comprised, the Ojib comprised of the Ojibwa, the Adawa, and the Potawatomi. Further to that, I would like to offer an Afrocentric land acknowledgement, and I would like to thank Kay Johnson from the Office of... Uh, <laughs> Oops, sorry. Office of Human Rights, Equity and Accessibility. As people of African descent, we offer this land recognition in solidarity with the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island in the efforts and deliberate intentions toward decolonization. We acknowledge the land of Turtle Island that was never meant to be owned. We recognize that most of the land that was entrusted to the indigenous peoples was in some cases shared by choice, but all too often taken by force. We recognize the historical colonialism and the ongoing colonialism that has led to the present day situation where land acknowledgements are offered in place of land. As people of African descent, many of us have come here by choice, while many are here as a result of historical force. We acknowledge the complexities where we were promised land that was never given by those whose it was never, it never was to give. As people of African descent, we acknowledge the land of Turtle Island that sustains us, express deep gratitude to its indigenous peoples and pledge to honor our dignity and divinity that ultimately connects us all. Thank you for that, uh, Miriam. Good morning and welcome everyone. It's my absolute honor to be invited to be one of your moderators for this morning's inaugural Distinguished Speaker Series event. Nana's work is so foundational to so many of us here, uh, myself included, and it's such a privilege to be in this space with all of you today. I'll begin by outlining the format of this morning's session. And after I go through some housekeeping items, I'll pass it along to Dr. Andrew Allen, who will introduce Nana properly. 
Nana will speak for about an hour, after which we'll take a five minute intermission break. And then after that, my esteemed co-moderator, Miriam tolson Murti, will lead a question and answer session. And this will be an opportunity for you, the audience members, to ask Nana your questions uh, about his address. So some housekeeping items before we begin. First, please be assured that audience members are muted and cameras are off so that everyone can enjoy the session without any disruptions. The chat or conversation feature has also been turned off. So in order to ask your questions at the end of the session, please push the raise hand button and we will take turns receiving your questions. When it's your turn, we'll unmute you and you will have the option of also uh, turning your camera on to ask your question directly. And finally, in today's session, we aim to create and maintain a respectful virtual environment. And to that end, we encourage audience members to be mindful and respectful in your comments, your questions, and your participation. I will now pass it along to Dr. Andrew Allen, the Anti-Racism Pedagogy's Teaching Leadership Chair here at the University of Windsor. Thanks, uh, Aisha. Uh, I'm so excited too, that, uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our inaugural speaker and the Vice President Equity, Diversity and Inclusion um, Distinguished Speaker Series in Anti-Racism and Anti-Oppression Pedagogies here at the University of Windsor. Dr. George Day is a widely sought after academic researcher and um, community worker whose professional and academic work has led to many Canadian and interna international speaking invitations in Europe, in USA and in Africa. Dr. Day is a professor of social justice education and the director for the Center of Integrative Anti-Racism Studies at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. He was named the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellow in 2015, 2016, 2018, and 2019, and received the honorary title of Professor Extraordinaire from the Department of Inclusion Education, I'm sorry, Inclusive Education at the University of South Africa. In 2017, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Academia's most prestigious award, as well as receiving the 2016 Withworth Award for Educational Research from the Canadian Education Association, awarded to the Canadian scholar whose research and scholarship has helped shape Canadian national educational policy and practice. Dr. Day received the um, the 2019 Paulo Freire Democratic uh, Projects uh, Award, the Chapman University Social Justice Award in 2021, and was honored the 2021 Lifetime Achievement Award from the Ontario Alliance of Black School Educators for his longstanding work promoting Black and minority, minority youth education. He has written 40 books and has more than 70 ref referee journal articles to his credit. In 2007, Seven, Dr. Day was installed as a traditional chief, of a, a traditional chief and given a stool of authority in the new Joaben traditional area of Ghana. And on a personal note, almost everyone that I spoke to and I told them about this talk, everybody I spoke to said, I've used him in my work. I have referenced your work. His work was instrumental in my writing and my thesis. So Nana, much love and respect for the body of work that you have created for us. You clear the pathway for us so that we could just walk through. I hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, can, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, yes, you can. Yeah, so I, I have titled my, my talk, Race and United Anti-Colonial Education, Mis Making Discursive Links. And and I do know um, we do have the um, land acknowledgement, but I also want to emphasize that to me, it's also a thanksgiving in terms of being here on the land uh, and also to invite the elders and the heritage chiefs to join us for this conversation. But it's the teachings of the land that I think to me, that guides me what I want to say. Uh, teachings about how we build communities, how we take responsibility seriously, and also how we create uh, uh, our, our relationship with, with each other. Uh, it is it is indeed an honor to be invited to give this distinguished speaker series, and I want to thank my good friend Andrew, but also Clinton, right, who I've been having some conversation with to engage in this. 
in, in my conversation, I want to focus on the academy, and I take the academy broadly as, as something which is like a space, a site, and a place where uh, it's not just learning that is taking place, but it's also how we come to act. What good is knowing if you don't act with it? Uh, and, and I think to me, in this regard, we have to see the academy uh, and the way it can be a partner in anti-colonial struggles, a partner to challenge some of the current mobilizations around fight grievances. Some of the vicious backlash that we see at the moment uh, against race and equity education, and obviously the calculated evocation of um, wokeness, right? Uh, but I also come into this conversation acknowledging um, the work that has been done in this institution. I'm talking about the University of uh, Windsor, right? Because I think here I'm here to contribute to a discussion about some of the theoretical and practical tools that help us to move beyond um, EDI models, equity, diversity, and inclusion, specifically to pursue EDI from an anti colonial lens. It's, it's what my goal and agenda is. Um, I've also recognized that recently the um, University of Windsor Faculty Association ratified a new collective agreement. And in that agreement, they recognize the impact and the additional demands that um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color faculty and librarians face in our work in these spaces. Uh, this to me signals the importance of paying attention to questions of EDI. So we have to ask questions about how do we develop our research and scholarship for decolonial and anti-colonial framings of EDI? How does our university in particular support this work? And what steps are required as a way forward? Uh, Andrew has been uh, a vice president of EDI, and I think we see the leadership that entails, but he would also need the support. It also has to be a way where we bring all our intellectual honesty to EDI work and to think through what are some of the concrete directions that need to be taken. We can't do this if you only see EDI as tick boxes. Diversity, equity, and anti racism initiatives are not tick boxes. I think we need a radicalization of EDI, which will acknowledge how epistemologies of dominance operate as we develop that which uh, others have talked about in terms of the incisive critiques of the violence of modernity. And I'm here speaking particularly when we talk about Black and Indigenous suffering, the necropolitics of anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity and the speciology of reparations, which I'll speak a bit about uh, in our institutions. And I refer to the speciology of reparations in terms of our institutions are built on indigenous people's lands. Slave labor were, was used to construct the architecture of these institutions. And yet black and indigenous learners always have to have a cap in hand, begging our institutions to do something for them. That's all right. I, I, I want to share some words of wisdom. And here I want to quote one of my doctoral students, right? When in a course that she took with me on Franz Fanon, she presented a paper, and there's a quote that I like to work with. Uh, Margaret Brigham um, says, quote, it is not important that everyone agrees with Fanon. So it's not important that everyone agrees with me what I'm going to say. However, it is most important that Fanon's work, so what I'm going to say, gives all of us a pedagogical foundation to interrogate to decolonize and to reconstruct our supposed beliefs and normalcies, unquote. I think the school is a microcosm of a wider society. And therefore, we need to be hyper cognizant and pursue a community approach, which entails collective responsibility to disrupt and to dismantle colonial and oppressive structures. I think that this is so important that we do that. But as we do this work, also to recognize that depending on one's location, depending on one's fear of influence, there are different actions that can be taken to bring about the systemic change that we want. I've long argued that any community is as good as we collectively work to make it. 
this calls for collective responsibility to talk about collective implications, how we build the communities that we want. There is an African adage which says, um, what one is called is important, but the most important thing is what one responds to. So when one is called, what is the call that you take up? To me, it's the question. And this is why we want to talk about allies. I want to talk about critical friends. And to me, critical friends are people who are always there. They are not just there when you need them. They are, they are always there. And that's what to me is the critical friends. They are always there. You know, nothing has to happen before they come up. They are going to be always there to, to, to raise the issues and the concerns and to be in battle to address the issues that we want to talk about. Now, as a black scholar, I always work with an epistemic challenge. Okay? Uh, and, and, and so in my work, I mean, while this epistemic challenge speaks to the question of decolonizing education, it, it, it has a bigger picture. It's, it's, it, it has many aspects to it, it has many legs, angles to it. There's the decolonizing the teaching practice, the discursive prisms that we use, and to code the substantive content of the curriculum is equally crucial. But so is also the space, the land that we do the work, the text we use, how we listen to each other, and how we engage collectively to dismantle colonial hierarchies. Paraphrasing read. One of my doctoral students recently told me something in class, which I also find useful when she said, if race is not part of the conversation, then we can't call it critical conversation. Zainab, one of my doctoral students. To me, what all this entails is the power of coming to know and to speak differently. There's that power of coming to know and to speak differently. To speak differently, that entails using our counter narratives, the restoring of our lives, and to work with speculative imaginaries. There's a power in working with these speculative imaginaries. So just to give you a sense of the terrain I want to work with, a bit about history and context, then get into where I'm coming from, and then engage in some discursive stances through which I theorize what really is decolonial change, highlighting some philosophical tenets and some of the key concepts that I think are very, very important for us to engage. And the implications of this work, questions about our own pedagogies, questions about evaluation and assessments of our learners in this period of the pandemic of COVID-19, what does EDI entail? And when we come to the institutional level, how do we implement a decolonial curriculum? What institutional, practical institutional guidelines can we offer? And then give some concluding remarks. So the history and context, racism and black racism on the Canadian landscape. I think there's some specific readings of historical and contemporary movements in time and the racialization, particularly of the black human that we have to confront. There is a long history of black, indigenous and racialized peoples in Eurasia, the colonial violence and atrocities, anti-black racism, anti-indigenous racism, anti-Asian racism, which have been enacted institutionally in Canada whether we look at it in terms of the courts, the justice system, our educational system, the media, health, employment, housing, and so forth. And there are certain spinets that we can talk about this problem when we talk about enslavement, when we talk about colonization, the forces of globalization, neoliberalism in particular, and the sway of Western modernity that all encapsulate this history and context that is worth highlighting. 
this history is also a history about whose lives matter and what lives matter. We see it in the indig indigenous genocide, residential schools. We've been seeing the horrors of residential schooling still to this day. We also see it in terms of the races of black and indigenous presence and contributions in history. We don't need to talk about Africa, Bill, where we know it very, very clearly. Some of the state denials of systemic, you can't even talk about systemic racism without somebody saying what is systemic. You ask about systemic racism and somebody says, well, there's nothing systemic about it. Yet, somebody can say, I'm going to call the New York Police Department and tell them I'm being harassed by a black person. And somehow think the police will believe her. That is systemic. She didn't mention any name. She didn't say, I'm going to call Officer Beckford to complain. She said, no, I'm going to call the New York Police Department and complain about being harassed. That's systemic racism that we're talking about. So where am I coming from? I want to work with a very, very, very provocative black radical thought. I think to me, and I'm not the only one who has said it, I didn't know that uh, my colleague Melinda Smith also talks about this. Institutional approaches to EDI have been empty signifiers. They are often pursued as an institutional expectation. Everybody expects institutions to do it. And you see it in the proliferation of discourses, the policy documents, the writings, particularly on equity and anti-Black racism. And yet, these things have no teeth, literally. There's no action and accountability. All of what they do is give us a sense of feel good, as Melinda Smith will talk about. I think it's very, very important to note uh, uh, one of my colleagues, Ronaldo Walcott, when he talks about EDI is deeply embedded in white capitalist logics and the question of modernity. And it is framed within Western liberal humanism. And somehow it is presented to a piece black, indigenous, and racialized bodies. I'm also coming at it with a concern that our institutions and their colonial hierarchies, what constitutes knowledge? How such knowledge should be produced, interrogated, validated, and disseminated internally and globally. Also, the ways our institutions, whether it's the court system, the schools, the justice system, media, the way our institutions maintain white privilege and white supremacy. There seems to be a reward for a close proximity to whiteness, and conversely, a close proximity to blackness is punished. I'm coming to this discussion because I feel that there's a need for us to confront our collective complexities in an oppressive institutionalized culture. The violence of claiming racial innocence, the violence of racial illiteracy, the violence of racial logics, settler coloniality, settler toxicity and the settler grammar. And one of our doctoral students, Melissa Wilson, recently talked about the musings of settler fantasy land. I also see the academy as a contested space, both in terms of the knowledge, the culture, and the mission which is in need of anti-colonial framing. From refusing the academy, as people like Ibtak and Sandy Grant talk about, 
to asking, and this to me is a critical question, what schools do we want and are willing to fight for? I'm also coming to the discussion fully aware of the continuing legacies of racial colonial imaginaries and the need to demystify and demythologize whiteness. We need to develop a consciousness that allows us to fight race and global inequities. With an awareness that there are people who are willing to be part of this struggle. And at the same time, there are those who are steadfastly digging in, in their heels and refusing to do anything about it through their denials, through their defensiveness, and through their open hostility to this work. There's this imperative that I see that for us to unravel and subvert the particularities of certain knowledges masquerading as universal. For example, the way Western dominant frames of analysis and the imposition of colonial systems of knowing and again our institutions, as my friend Uturpa Uju recently also writes about. We need to question the prevailing logics, the prevailing rules of reason, the standards of logic and rationality that masquerade in our institutions. The dominant logics, what I call the white authorization white control, white credibility, and what is missing in all these dialogues. I'm also coming at it because I think we need to understand the complex ways a coloniality of race and racism works to dismantle or wants to grant dominant bodies an equal protection of their human rights their dignity, representation, and resources. Multiculturalism does not cut it. It will not solve the problem of racism because racism is a socially constructed system of racial hierarchy, and we must name it that way. It's not about bias, it's not about discrimination, it's not about culture. It is about a system of racial hierarchy which is supported by institutionalized power that privilege dominant groups. That's what racism is. Multiculturalism does not carry it. There's also this silence and denial of particular identities that we are seeing of late. And the US gives us a perfect context, but don't let us be so complacent that it's happening in the US as if it wouldn't happen in Canada. Right? We see the vicious backlash to anti-racist education, where in Florida, in Idaho, and other places in the States, politicians are advancing bills in schools and universities that will prohibit the teaching of critical race theory. And the sad part of this is that this is a manufactured problem. Why, why do you say it's, it's a manufactured problem? Because one, the places that they are prohibiting the teaching of critical race theory, critical race theory is not even being thought in the schools in the first place. So it's a manufactured crisis. But the silencing and denial also plays out in a different way. For example, we see it in the ways whiteness shapes conversations that we have. I don't need to remind you about Kai Rittenhouse, the conversation about a white young lad who is giving, who is being cut some slack. He's allowed to do certain things. And you wonder if it was a black young lad, he would get the same slack. And then just suppose the Kai Rittenhouse trial with the Ahmad Berry. 
Ahmad Berry was up to no good. Car rating house was defending property. Look at the contracts. And then we hear now about parents' bill of rights. Nobody even asks, what parents are we talking about? What parents are we talking about when we talk about parents' bill of rights? So you're teaching critical race theory, we're going to develop a parents' bill of rights. Well, what parents are we talking about? And why should a few conservative parents decide what schools to teach our children? Who are raising these voices? This is why, to me, I think we need to define the school curriculum burden. Long ago, me and my students, we called it the deep curriculum. It's not just the text, it's not just the instruction, it's not just the pedagogy, but the culture, the climate, the environment, the social organizational life of the schools are all part of this curriculum. The curriculum is a breathing document. It's living, it's life. It offers us a path to follow. It is also power saturated and has components of learning libraries and literacies of knowledge. And this is why it's so important for us to explore the curriculum from an anti racist, anti colonial, and decolonial lens to challenge the way grand narratives of the empire have been constructed to disrupt Canadian consciousness of its past in history. The history of land displacement, land dispossession, African enslavement, indigenous genocide, and the residential schools. So what decreases stances do I want to take? I think to me, decolonization is a political and institutional act. It begins by asking new questions. Also, the anti-colonial is intimately connected to decolonization. And by extension, decolonization cannot happen solely through Western science scholarship. Hello, it will not happen through Western science scholarship because Western science scholarship is part of the problem. If you want to decolonize, we have to look for a particular place from other non-Western ways of knowing, indigenous philosophies, epistemologies that allow us to challenge to disrupt, subvert, and reimagine counter-narratives to colonial thinking and some of the conventional practices of schooling and education. The fourth discursive stance for me is that the complex problem facing our world today defy universalist solutions. They require what I call long ago multicentricity, multicentric ways of doing, knowing, being, and acting. So those are four discussion stances. These discussion stances help me to theorize what constitutes decolonial change. Because it works with certain philosophical tenets. One is the notion of multicentricity. Recognizing multiple cultural fans of knowledge. The second is that of indigeneity, engaging indigenous and Western philosophies of living as practices. Third, reflexivity, which allows us to connect to our environments, our social, our physical environments, including the metaphysical. But it also calls for a politics of position, knowing where one is but also a policy of relation, seeing oneself as implicated in what one is talking about. And this reflexivity also calls for localizing theory in order for meaningful action to be possible. Theory cannot hang in space. It must be grounded. It must be localized. Long ago, I agree that the worth of a social theory is measured by two things. One is the philosophical tenets of the theory, but it's also the ability of that theory to offer a social and political corrective. If a theory does not offer a social and political corrective, it's not a theory worth engaging. It's not just about the philosophical tenets of the theory. 
It's about the ability of that theory to offer a social and political corrective. And if a theory does not offer that, but only offer the philosophical tenets, then it's not a theory worth engaging. You must offer the philosophical tenets, but also the ability of that theory to offer a social and political corrective. Then the fourth, in terms of the philosophical tenets of theorizing due culinary change, is that embodied knowings. Questions of representation, how we implicate the self, our identities, our culture, and our histories. Recognizing what Stuart Hall a long time ago said, we all speak from a particular place, from a particular context, within a particular culture. It's about feminist mantra, the partiality of knowing. I don't have all the answers, but my voice should damn well be part of the conversation. There are other voices that are missing from the dialogue. They must be part of the conversation. Stacey Abrams recently said something, which we've all been saying, but she put it nicely for me when she says, one cannot be what one cannot see. That's the question of the power of representation. One cannot be what one cannot see. There's also the power of visuality which marks itself in the visual landscapes of our institutions. You know, one thing I've always wondered is, you go into our institutions and you see the pictures hanging on the walls, and there are all these dead white men that are hanging on the walls. And you ask, how come we don't have other people? The world, they said, well, these were the people who were the top administrators, the, the principals, the, the leaders of the institution. Well, what about the janitors who also contributed to make the school what it is? What about the people who swept the rooms where the students learned from? Didn't they also make the school what it is? How come we can't have their pictures also on the wall? But we also have to have only the leaders' pictures on the wall. This is the issue of visuality that needs to be disrupted. But certain concepts and conceptualizations are also very important. One is to be in the question of modernity. Modernity. It is a phase in human development, we all know, but it's characterized by certain ideas. The way we talk about neoliberalism, Western democracy, views of the cosmopolitanism, issues about liberal justice, individual rights, freedoms, global citizenship, and how these are all within the spread of corporate American and Western consumerist culture. We need to trouble this because it offers a supposed shift in a more rational human existence. But it's characterized by a particular mode of thought, which is defined by the ideas and values of West and Western Europe. And we need to trouble it. There's also, as Mignolo a long time ago said, there's a colonial modernity dialectic that suppresses the ontologies, the epistemologies of Black, African, Indigenous, and racialized and colonized peoples. And it suppresses them by universalizing white Western liberal subject as representative of humanity. And part of this is that we need to see how through time, this modernity coloniality dialectic or the tandem has worked to coach, replace, disavow, distort, and deny the knowledges, the subjectivities, and world senses, and life visions of other people as McDonald and Walsh write well. And in more profound ways, Western modernity has been marked by a particular race thinking, which has functioned to change the rules of reason, the standards of logic and rationality. And this is the logic that I talk about, the white logic, the white authorization, white control, and white credibility. Nothing ever existed until it is legitimized by a dominant body. Quinjano long ago said coloniality is modernity. But the point is that it is not only territorial, it is also a way of thinking. That's why we need to unchain our minds. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of desiring. It's a way of acting. And we need to call on the failure to subvert 
what an anonymous writer says, the Western colonial mission of how the universal and the global are most often perceived. There's this continued refusal to challenge, quote, European paradigms of rational knowledge, unquote, with Jano. I think there is, when we talk of modernity, to think through in different lenses. For example, the strategic intellectual and political project of Black, African, and Indigenous and racialized learners and other anti-colonial subjects calling upon their own micro-narratives of what consists other modernities. So they will question the dominant modernity with other modernities. And these other modernities allow us to offer a grammar of Black, Indigenous, with charity, where the past, the present, and the future are linked. It's like a spiral, back and forth, that is related. It's not in a hierarchical linearity. You, move, you don't move from the past to the present to the future. No, the present has the past. The future also has the past. It's a spiral back and forth. It's not linear. This allows us to talk about indigenous modernity as the Bolivian anti-colonial feminist indigenous writer, Silvera Sinsukwankin, talks about indigenous modernity. Then anti-colonial theory is also something to work with. Because anti-colonial theory is not about definitions in and of itself. It's an explanation of the ways relationships and the exercise of power are embedded within an anti-capitalist critique. Art, to me, becomes a critical tool to work with rather than a normative statement. It becomes an interrogation of the ways bodies, knowledges, and experiences, histories are positioned in hierarchical relationship. Anti-colonial theorizing stresses the fact that the school is not a neutral space. There are implications for what is learned or what is internalized as a learned disposition. How violence in itself can be concealed and embedded in common sense knowledge of the dominant. And this is something that Boudot, Pierre Boudot, long ago talked about in terms of the notion about symbolic violence. I think the anti-colonial theorizing, the colonial should also be taken broadly as speaking not just to anything which is foreign and alien, but also as speaking to anything that is imposed and dominating. This is where the coloniality of power comes into play. Because there's a particular imperial power which is beyond the power and agency of the sub in turn or the sub or turn or the subordinated. It is the power of the colonial dominant. And this to me is a Fanonian read as opposed to a Foucauldian read. Foucault talks about power being diffused, circulating, which is good. But I need to bring a Fanonian read of power, which is that there's the power of the colonial dominant that although we all have power, the power of the colonial dominant is a different kind of power. That is the Fanonian read. So beyond the power being diffused and circulating, we need to talk about the power of the colonial dominant. Anti-colonial theorizing also calls for a central place for indigenous social ontologies and the literacies of healing. It also calls into play the authenticity of the indigenous the sub intern voice, because it becomes an epistemology of the oppressed, the colonized, which is anchored in the indigenous sense of collective and common colonial consciousness. Coloniality, we know, never existed in a vacuum. It existed within a context of imperial logics, power structure with varied complicities, responsibilities, and accountability of different bodies. But the thing about coloniality is that at any time 
there is the process and the project of community, there's also resistance. There's no violence without resistance. There's no oppression without resistance. And that's what anti-colonial theorizing brings into play, that we also need to talk about that. And that's a key gaze of anti-colonial theorizing should be on what I've called the cultism of white supremacist logics. And the way it functions to normalize oppressive relations and practices. I already earlier mentioned about this cultural arbitrariness of white norms, which is presented as universal. Art seeks radical change through subversive and abolitionist politics. It's not a politics of mere acknowledgement. It's not a politics of validation. It's not a politics of just having a dialogue. It's not a politics of reconciliation or mutual engagement. It calls for subversive abolitionist politics. And to me, a subversive abolitionist politics would not talk simply about reconciliation or restitution. It will argue that in order for reconciliation to happen, there must be restitution. But anti-colonial theory also acknowledges something which is very important for the way we do our work, whether it's EDI or anti-racism struggles and so forth. It's about acknowledging the D slash colonial tension that any time we try to decolonize, the colonial is hanging behind. The colonial is hanging behind. So we also have to deal with this tension that any time we try to decolonize, the colonial is hanging is lurching behind. This is why I say I've never met a decolonial or uh, decolonized person. I've never met a person who is decolonized. It's a process that we continually have to go through because any time we try to decolonize, the colonial is lurching behind. So there's that D slash colonial tension that we have to confront with. The other concept is indigeneity. And there's a question about land, but the land is not a physical thing. It's also a spiritual, a cultural, emotional, and a psychological. And as Leanna Simpson talks about, it offers us a way to think about the social, psychic, and cultural, and spiritual memories which become living forces that we can learn from. But the indigeneity also allows us to see the human broadly, to define human broadly, to include plants, animals, water, rocks, because we can learn something from them. What do plants teach us? They have life. They offer something to learn. Not only is some of us, our humanity being taken away from us, but we need to reclaim it. And that's part of redefining the human. But it's also defining the human in a way that is more inclusive of others. But powerfully, indigeneity brings the, the teachings of the land Teachings of relationality, sharing, reciprocity, connections, mutual interdependence. This is the only way we build communities. We build communities through social responsibility and also ensuring accountability. We don't build communities when people will think, okay, we have all these nice policies in the schools, but nobody is being held accountable when these policies are not being put into practice to achieve the desired effects. That's not, to me, fighting justice. The question of accountability is very, very central to that debate. But we can't talk about indigeneity without also recognizing that there are cartographies of indigenous, that indigeneity is a relational and transnational category. It defines borders and localism, and is lodged on different lands geographies and spaces. So we have Turtle Island indigeneity, we have African indigeneity, we have Caribbean indigeneity, we have Hawaiian indigeneity, Latin American indigeneity. And then what can each learn from each other? You know, I always tell my students, the only reason why I'm able to talk about African indigeneity in Canada is because when I came to this land and I saw indigenous people of Turtle Island claiming their knowledges, it gave me the power to talk about my African indigeneity which people want to take away from me, and I want to claim it back. That is the cartography 
of indigeneity. But the thing that indigeneity also talks about is give us a sense that Europe is not the advent of human history. The world did not begin with Europe. Our story is not only about colonialism. There was a world before that, as Alfred and Contessato speak about. When we engage this discourse, it allows us to think about how we write back to the imperial and colonial narrative, that power of writing back. We, write, we use the indigenous philosophy, the indigenous thought, the indigenous prism, the counter narratives to write back to the imperial and colonial narrative. Then the big word, decolonization. Decolonization is subversive. It's not superficial add-on. It requires action to dismantle and rebuild, as Taiki, Mihush, and Wilson long ago talked about. Decolonization is also about building relationships on lands and sites, schools, media, local communities, and beyond, as Ichak and Yang talk about, Patrick Wolf. It also calls for developing a critical consciousness of oneself, where we are, the history that we bring into these spaces, the identities that we need to emphasize and affirm, the culture and the spiritual memories. That's about decolonization. Decolonization is also about dismantling, but it's also about abandoning all reflexes of subordination as Sheikh Antidiop writes. To me, decolonization is not mainstreaming practice. If we seek validation of our decolonial practice from the dominant, it loses its edge as decolonial. So decolonization is not about mainstreaming practice. A decolonial project cannot seek legitimation and validation from the dominant. Decolonization requires parting with the ways our colonial vestiges have been embedded, have been in many ways built into the way we run our systems and how we need to break away from these hierarchical relationships. We can't talk about decolonization without also making a special case for settler decolonization, because that calls for rematriation of land, addressing the, the violence of removing black indigenous bodies from their lands, and also relinquishing, as I talk about, settler futurities through land back movements. Decolonization also speaks about resistance of ways settler colonialism through processes of racialization and racial capitalism domesticates indigenous, particularly Tetra Island indigeneity, and make Tetra Island as part of racial minorities, rather than see Tetra Island as a colonized nation, as Martin Cannon raises. But also, to me, decolonization, Fanon is informative here, where it moves from discourse and theory to actual practice and action. And we are able to distinguish between what Fanon would talk about pseudo decolonization, which is the false flag decolonization. It's about the myth of independence. Oh, we are decolonized, we are independent. But yet, the World Bank and the IMF is deciding policies for us. That is the myth, the myth of decolonization. It's a pseudo decolonization. Decolonization has to be genuine decolonization. It has to be real, it has to be authentic, and it emerges from struggles that oppose both the colonizer and the colonized. This is very important because sometimes the colonized has so imbued the values and the attributes of the colonizer that they revisit the oppression on their own kind. And that colonizer and that colonized who revisit the oppression on their own kind needs to be resisted. That to me is that genuine decolonization. So it implicates both the colonized and the colonizer 
who has learned the trappings of the colonizer. The colonized, who has learned the trappings of the colonizer. He or she needs to be resisted. But that's my friend, Bolivia Santi also writes, decolonizing is not just de-westernizing, but rather is the total reassertion of indigenous African communities, et cetera, at the center of knowledge discovery, interrogation, validation, and dissemination, unquote. Decolonization calls for an authentic commitment to anti-colonial project. I see decolonization as a path to an anti-colonial end. See the anti-colonial as the path to a decolonial end. That's fine. I like to see the other way around, that decolonization because it's a process to an anti-colonial end. And that this decolonization at the end of the day is all about dismantling colonial structures. Then race, anti-blackness, indigeneity, and decolonial links. The speciality of blacknesses is happens on different landscapes. It's not just in Canada. Anti-blackness is global. There's anti-blackness in Africa. There's anti-blackness in the Caribbean, in Latin America. So it's global. But the specificity of anti-blackness is rooted in slavery, colonialism, and denials of African and black women. There are also cartographies and multidimensionality of blacknesses. Because this blackness is itself, race, its class, its gender, its sexualized. And there are multi-generational legacies of the different dimensions of blackness and anti-blackness. I think when we engage race, anti-blackness, and indigeneity in decolonial links, it calls for problematizing essentialist understanding of race and the institutional expectations around race, blackness, and indigeneity. One of these institutional expectations that I talk about is how we know when John, John the George Floyd, uh, every institution, every school felt the need to issue a solidarity statement in support of Black Lives Matter. And you, it's like a race. Everybody wanted to issue a solidarity statement. And you ask, where have you been all these years? It's a performance. But these links of race, blackness, anti-blackness, and the decolonial is only meaningful if you are able to examine the precarity and containment of black, indigenous, and racial lives on the landscape. So when we look at the Canadian landscape, people talk about the displacement, the dispossession, but also McKettrick and Robin Maynard they both talk about this question of the controls of black mobility. Marketrix used the word herbicide. It's about black geographies, but it's also about the impossibility of black humanity. This discussive links of blackness, indigeneity also calls for looking at black and indigenous relationalities how both groups, quote, have been targets of so social and spatial controls that have derived from our, our normalized relations or positions in relation to the Canadian settler state and citizenship, as Robin Maynard writes. Consequently, teaching and learning blackness and indigeneity must be in radical relationality. We talk about land dislocations, displacement, dispossession, but we also talk about the intersectionality of bodies and labor on different lands and spaces. That's bad rights. But it's also calls for naming the satellite. We should name the satellite. And we, make, we have to be clear when we talk about the satellite, what we mean. We are talking about the colonial settler, the white settler. So what it means and the, polit the politics of naming the satellite. Because if you don't engage the politics of why we need to name who the settler is, it doesn't bother well for co-resistances and anti-colonial solidarity. We need anti-colonial solidarity among racialized and colonized groups. So blacks and indigenous groups need to be in solidarity. 
And this is why there is that power in naming the settler for who the settler is. Settler is about theft, it's about genocide. It's about that terror analysis, the person who goes into a space claiming that everything was for them. Nothing existed until they came there. Rewriting history, denying history, that's a settler. So you begin to ask yourself, who is denying history? Who is rewriting history? And call them the settler. Discussions of settler colonialism must engage African indigeneity and anti-blackness. The process of racialization and how black and African bodies have been crucial to settler colonial nation projects. And then decolonial education must connect black liberation and indigenous sovereignty. It calls for a radical black geography, a radical black pedagogy that addresses the hyperconsumption, the appropriation, the criminalization of blackness, including how black popular culture has intensified anti-blackness and anti-black racism. And Jay talks about it as blackophilia or blackophobia. A radical black pedagogy must interrogate the historical lineage that continues to support a white supremacist agenda and leads to anti-blackness, unquote, Baker Bell and others. It also calls for us to investigate and to interrogate how our institutions often human humanize white bodies while simultaneously vilifying black people. For example, Western media humanizes white criminals while at the same time dehumanizing black indigenous or Muslim victims. We see it in the compromising photos of black victims and the depictions of injustice movements, the different, the double standards in the depictions of justice movements. A radical black pedagogy should assist learners to examine how the construction of code, the images that promote racial inferiority contributes to a lack of empathy for black life, leading to a public desensitization to black pain, suffering, angst, black humanity, and death. The necropolitics, unquote, Baker, Bell, and others. Such pedagogy, I'm talking of the radical black pedagogy, must raise questions about the absences, the omissions, the negations, the denials, and engage in critical historical texts that debunk Greek Roman whiteness assertions. It also calls for ensuring the production and promotion of knowledge and resources that allow our diverse communities, our black and indigenous and racialized communities to see themselves in their own representations in school sites. A radical black pedagogy must advocate and support the development of self and collective healing processes and outlets within black, indigenous, racialized communities. Because this is very important as we engage in our own healing, our own unlearning. This radical black pedagogy must support black, indigenous, and racialized youth leadership and social activism. Because what happens is that rather than rewarding resistance, we do punish resistance. And that who are those who are punished for their resistance? They are black bodies the racialized bodies, the indigenous bodies who are resisting their oppression, and yet they are punished. So we need that pedagogy to actually reward their social resistance, to reward their social justice struggles, the activism, rather than punish them for it. But a radical black pedagogy must address one particular black contention. I call it black contention. And this is particularly the question of media and anti-black racism. You see, long ago, this has always existed in black communities. This perception that 
the media is never our friend. It has never been, and we never trust the media. Raymond talks about a long time ago, writing about our elders taught us long ago about media injustice. Malcolm X warned us in 1964 that the press is irresponsible. It will make the criminal look like the victim and make the victim look like the criminal, unquote. You see this re reversal, which is very, very much evident today, right? They were writing about this for a couple of years, decades back, but you see it not quite long ago, right? You saw it in the George Zimmerman and the Trevor Martin case, the reversals. We saw it in that Darren Wilson and the Mike Brown case, the Brian Senior and the Sandra Hard Bland case. We also see it in different ways in Trevor Martin and Carl Rittenhouse. Carl Rittenhouse gets to live out his youth and gets sympathy, but Trevor Martin was never given that for his youth. He was more seen as a criminal. He was adultified the adultification of black youth. This radical black pedagogy that I'm speaking about must challenge perceptions of black indigenous lives as not complex and are, quote, therefore unworthy of sophisticated critical analysis and reflection by hooks. We must challenge that. It also must challenge the perception of the white subject as the producer of knowledge. The white subject as the all-knowing, the producer of knowledge, and the black, the African, the indigenous, the racialized subject as the objective of the dominant gaze, unquote, Davis and Walsh. This pedagogy must be critical educational practice. It must be a critical educational process that allow us to restore in our lives, black lives, and to also talk about the carceral projects of black social and spatial exclusions. We see it in the geographies and the logics of over-policing, the criminalization, and the panoptic surveillance of black bodies through a culture of what Warren Critchlow calls the weaponized and prison black hyper-masculinities, unquote. That over-policing, the criminalization, the way Black masculinity is viewed in society. But in telling about blackness, there also has to be a corresponding focus on what Blake calls trauma-free blackness. This is paying attention to aspects of black life, black joy, happiness, not just the pain and the suffering. And move away from that relentless and persistence of black grief and anguish. In our understanding blackness as existing outside of trauma, black life, which is not filtered through the lens of racism, but through celebrations of music, arts, literature, sports, celebration of culture and community break. Set pedagogy must also go beyond racial trauma. No, of course we should talk about racial trauma, but we need to go beyond racial trauma to talk about the black resistance and the resurgences, the black creative ways of living as process. There are certain implications for decolonial education that I briefly just want to talk about. I think one is about asking questions of our pedagogies. And this is more for practitioners. How does coloniality show up in our schools? We need to ask that question. Look at the colonial hierarchies, the merit badges the white credibility, the white dominant frames of preference. How do our schools provide institutional support and medium for white supremacist logics or ideology? We do so by not asking the tough questions about white power and privilege. And when we do so, we see educators participating in the privileging of whiteness, who are deemed as experts on the black and African experience or on race and other matters affecting our communities. We also ask the question what it means to reflect on the values that have been established over time as facts 
and used to erect a white racist narrative that underpins professionalism. So for example, white standards of dress, hair, the sari and the buyer that are not considered professional. So you wear that. So I wear my African smock. No, to be professional, you have to wear a certain dress and certain attire. There are dominant narratives of time and timeliness that needs to be subverted through these questions. We need to ask questions about how do we understand white supremacist culture, as Tema Ukun long ago discussed. So for example, CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, own Afro-Latina reporter, right, Massa, is said to be the first hijab-wearing TV anchor person. That is great. But the question we don't ask is, why did it take so long to have that? That's a question to be asked. Why did it take so long? Rather than celebrating that, oh, yes, we now have a first hijab-wearing national reporter, why don't we ask, why did it take that long to have that? Also, how colonialist discourse shape the race, class, gender, and sexualized meanings of Black, Indigenous people's public biographies. And to me, nothing comes more to mind when I talk about this than the way the Western media covered the South African track and field star, Casa Simonyol. Because they use gender verification policies, which were steeped in Western demorphic definitions of sex and gender in their interrogation. And Cookie Walking writes about this. And recently, an anonymous writer is taking this up. So we ask questions about pedagogy, but also I pay attention also to questions of evaluation and assessments in schools. To see race in assessment and see assessment in race the overrepresentation of white bodies in teaching and the professorial. Assessment materials and practices continue to ensure and anticipate white learners, white experiences, and white epistemologies. That ontological whiteness of how we understand success in schools. As my former student and I, a colleague, Alukem, writes about. Also to recognize that assessment necessarily follows a series of previous learning activities which themselves occur within Euro-white centric contexts. And assessment has been too late to come to the party of re-evaluation. It cannot just be a panacea. It's more than that. Assessments must be inclusive in both content and media, working to identify and support the success of all students. Widespread research recognizes persistent bias, both in standardized assessments and often in more local practices, as Ken Ezra, Dirad, Parkesh, and others write about. There's a significant need for educators to look for race based patterns in assess students' work and to use the information to reflect and adapt our teaching and assessment practices. Increased standardization in assessment is linked with a contraction of curriculum, both the breadth and the depth of the curriculum in our teaching styles. This limits two things which are very important. It limits teachers' ability, one, to attend to and support students in one and one basis or on one and one or small group basis. And two, it limits teachers' ability to incorporate anti-racist, anti-colonial approaches and materials in the assessment practices, as Ken writes about. We also have to look at what all this implies in working with the lessons of COVID-19. We know that COVID-19 has added to schooling challenges in times or in a climate of reduced resources, inequities in online technology, shifts in schooling demographics, and the calls, the real hard calls 
to center questions of race, equity, and social justice. We need to address race and equity implications of remote learning, access to stable internet, and computer access are issues. Some students are most vulnerable here. Reduce access to material resources, inadequate academic support during these times. All what this is doing is that it's compounding the problem of racism and educational inequities. We also need to examine new modalities and methodologies of teaching. Educators, as part of regular practice, must look for equity-based patterns in our work and use this information for reflecting and adapting our teaching and curricular practices. I'm speaking about making online teaching more humane, addressing access, <coughs> addressing access and equity issues in technology, global, national, regional, and sectoral inequities in modern technology, online use and access. Providing resources to achieve socially just teaching and learning online. Responding to rising online digital hate. But we also know that some online platforms, online learning platforms, when you look at the resources that are in the learning modules, they need revision to include non-white and non-hegemonic content and also to devise multiple strategies for assessing students during online teaching with different modalities. So I come to the last session, which is more speaking about our institution, what our institutions need to do. And yet, briefly, implementing decolonial curriculum, some practical institutional guidelines. One is to look at institutional policy implementation. There's a need to develop institutional implementation strategies for the diversification of decolonial curriculum with focused attention on Black, African, and Indigenous and other racialized learners. Our institutions need to set clear guidelines, timelines, academic expectations, measures of accountability to meet Black and African indigenous and diverse public demands. In other words, we need an institutional framework to support strategies for inclusive teaching, identification of staff, school mandates, and meeting demands of underdeserved or underserved, sorry, underserved communities. Our institutions need to work towards the development of equity standards of some kind to assess the effectiveness and success of policy implementation across all courses, whether it's in the arts, the social sciences, or even STEM, to ensure the enhancement of social and academic performance of Black, African, Indigenous, and other racialized learners. Our institutions also need to pay attention to governance issues, including designing and implementation strategies on the scope and organizational structure of schools, departments, etc., to be inclusive. There's an important goal here, which is about accountability measures. Because what happens is that, as Sarah Ahmed talked just a long time ago, there's a non performativity or the non performance speech acts of our institutions. These things are normally put out there for show. There are no accountability measures. Nobody is held accountable when the policy is not being implemented or when somebody, something goes astray. And so it becomes on the show. There is this on the books. There is this on the shelves. It's performance. Second is specific equity initiatives. Schools, academic divisions, departments need to revisit their objectives, their mandate, and policies and practices. 
to consider internal exclusion barriers for Black, African, Indigenous, and racialized learners, and what needs to be done to remove systemic barriers. It may be a requirement to have periodic annual per periodic curriculum review of educational programs and to introduce new courses. That means the demands of our times. Courses that have deep impact on Black, African, Indigenous, and other racialized learners. It's about the question of relevance. Also incentivizing the department academic programming initiatives that promote decolonizing and anti-colonial teaching and learning methodologies. I think there needs to be incentives for this. And of course, creating funds to support such initiatives. We all talk about equity, anti-racism, cost money. It cannot just be lift service. We need to put our resources where our mouth is. We need to have a, think, a serious thinking through of how local community groups and bodies and organizations who are also working on EDI on the ground can help us in our programming. The academy is not a space for just academics. The community must have a way into these spaces. And we need to tap what they are doing on the ground on EDI that we find useful in the way we do our programs within these institutions. Of course, the question of community outreach to address the question of educational relevance of Black, African, Indigenous, and racialized learners in communities that we prepare to serve. Educators making the connection and grounding ourselves in our local communities as a form of knowledge generation, teaching, dissemination, and academic responsibility. We must know our learners, the communities they come from, know these communities in order to be good teachers. Also, our institutions should help identify community issues that need to re need redress through joint consultation with these communities. Knowledge generation must be a joint exercise, working with communities to generate knowledge. No wonder one of my former students gave me a paper when I asked for a title of papers for a paper conference. He said, the natives have become their own researchers. The natives have become their own researchers because they have been so disappointed with how this happened. On pedagogies and methodologies to diversify curriculum through development of new modalities of teaching. I'm getting some signal about the time, so let me just. And then I spoke about assessments and evaluation to deal with the Eurocentric evaluation methods. To think through different ways of assessing our students. And there's also research and infrastructure support to work with our communities and the way we think about research and analytic research. So I conclude with a couple of retreat points. I think we need to develop the courage to resist, to speak race, indigenity, and decolonization, to see teaching and learning as a way of writing back to the colonial imperial narrative, to cultivate in our learners an awareness of what it means to claim an identity and history to build communities, to decolonize, and to design their own futures. We must see the academy as a place of refuge, as Martin and Hannah talked about, but also as a site of liberation, as Robin Kelly talks about. It must be a site of anti-colonial learning. It must be a place for us to be in. We must be there. We have every right to be there, but we must not make the academy our institutions makers. 
we must develop a path of becoming subversive educators or learners. I've called that becoming academic warriors. And I borrow that from what at Ronnie's point, Gorilla intellectuals who are working to dismantle colonial structures. Social justice education must be for inclusive, holistic human liberation. That's what it should be. And we need to ask the question, what is education for? What schools do we want? And what schools are we willing to fight for? All along working with the hope that there's a possibility of another possible. We must develop that critical awareness of our institutional negligence, the strength and the nature of institutional negligence around anti-Black racism and anti-Indigenous racism. How institutions manipulate Black, Indigenous, and racialized excellence to do what Mandela Gray talks about, to do a penance and have their conscience cleansed. This has become a path of redemption. It's a very, very tricky move. It's a trick because it doesn't get us to the way of true, authentic liberation. It's just doing a penance. It's just giving the institutions a path for redemption. And then we must talk about the speciality of operations, which is the issue about our schools are built on indigenous people's lands. Slave labor was used to construct the architecture. And yet our black African indigenous learners always have to have a cap in hand, begging for our institutions to do something for them. That's all right. And finally, if you are doing this work, if you are in these institutions, it's very, very important for you to set what I've called a trialectic space. It's a swahunu, a trialectic space. It's a space where we do our work, but it's a space where we pursue our education with a sanctity and the sacredness of that activity. Thank you, Asante Sana. Thank you, thank you, Nana. Thank, thank you so you. much on behalf of all of us present here today. Thank you. We can see the applauses at the bottom of the screen. Thank you for your prolific and inspirational and aspirational address. You asked, what good is knowing if we don't act on it? Um, there's so much to ponder and, and consider. Um, and we're so grateful to you for sharing your words and your wisdom um, your exceptional wisdom with us today. I was frantically taking notes as you were speaking and I'm sure many others uh, were as well, so thank you. Um, we're now going to take a five minute uh, intermission. Please feel free to stretch your legs, uh, get some water, contemplate all the insightful words and questions that Nana has just shared with us. And then when we return, we will start our question and answer session. And the reminder that if you have a question, please push the raise hand button and we will call on you to unmute and ask your question directly. So we'll take our intermission now. We'll return at 11 at 35. Thank you, everyone. Okay. So once again, thank you, Nana. That that was extremely powerful. And we, we just... They're, they're saying thank you is, isn't a strong enough word. So just, <laughs> I, we're just so appreciative of your, your time here today and sharing all of your research and knowledge with us. Um, so I am going to open up the floor for questions and please don't hesitate to ask. Um, I do see one question from Hassan Adnan uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, if you'd like to ask your question, please go ahead. Thank you, first of all, the University of Windsor, Dr. Clinton and Dr. Allen's team putting this together. And thank you, Muse, for coming to us and educating us. My question is, you talked about the importance of resources. And I think I found out, you, I really love University of Windsor. That's where I graduated. And I found that it's a very, very important in terms of investment of resources. So. How, what would you give an advice? Because every time that 
like we chasing every time that happens on a drama or something, then they put out release and all of that. So now we created this department, which has brought you in, which is good. So what would you advise? And if you look at it, the department, it's the smallest department in the whole institution. What kind of advice would you give this team that's leading Dr. Clinton that they stay forever? And also we are shaping students, 10,000 students a year. And that kind of investment, how do, where do we start? Oh, Nana, just a reminder, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah, so no, no, that's an excellent question. I, 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 I think this is the whole thing about, look, equity work, right, costs money. And that must be something that we should all know it, right? Don't expect to achieve equity to address these issues about anti-racism, um, social justice education, without having the commitment, the resources. So we need uh, the institutions to commit resources to that. If institutions are serious, they must have a seed money that is committed to the development of this initiative. I've always argued that you can't have education today, which is anything but anti-racist, anti-classist, anti-homophobic, and so forth, right? And, and if you buy that mantra, then what it means is that everything that we do, right? It's like what one of my students said, if race is not part of the conversation, it's not a critical conversation. If the university is not addressing these issues around race, racism, uh, social justice, and so forth, then it's not a university that is actually moving with the times, right? So there must be a commitment. There must be a pool of money that is set aside for, for that. Right? And I've realized that money won't solve the problem, but it's a very big aspect of it, right? Because you cannot just simply see people to do this as labor of love. You can't expect people to do this simply without having the resources to do that. And I think that's where they must be. Our institutions always get the money when they need it, right? I always talk about my institution and say, well, every time you see them, okay, we are, we are making this renovation here on this floor and that floor. How come we don't have money for equity? How come we don't have money for for, for anti-racism? How come we don't have money for uh, social justice issues? That we find the money when we want to find it. So it must be, there must be a commitment. This is why leadership is so important. Leadership is so important. And I think all of us who are committed to these issues around EDI, anti-racism and so forth, right? We must have our voices push this, 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 this question about resources to support and sustain these initiatives. Otherwise, they'll just be a show. They'll be a pony show, right? And we don't want that, right? And that, because our institutions, uh, that's what I mean by the penance. They do this penance, right? Uh, and, and we need to call them up when they do that. We need to call them up. And I think to me, leadership is the very, very key here, right? They must, we must have, even if it, call, it calls for looking at the budget seriously to, to make sure that there's always going to be resources for these issues because they are very, very central to the survival of our institutions. Thank you, Nana, and thank you, Hassan, for that very important question. Uh, next, we have Eileen Santiago. Eileen, would you like to ask your question, please? Hi there. Sorry, I'm just on Hi. Hello, Nana. Thank you so much. I just want to say uh, about uh, well, I don't think I can say nothing. Nothing can really do justice to uh, all of the information and and the knowledge you've shared with us, the collective wisdom that you you, you know, through your experience and and scholarship. So anyway, having said that, my question, um, you know, I struggle with this. Uh, I know that we have to decentralize and not uh, give in to the pressure to appease a white gaze. But yeah. sometimes I feel how how much, uh, you know, we also can't avoid them, right? We have mm -hmm. to, they're the ones who are in positions of power, mm -hmm. they're the ones. Mm -hmm. So how, how much energy should we devote to white settler education, if we call it that? Yeah. Uh, in, in, in this process of decolonizing and disruption, how, how much would you say, how, how useful is yeah. that? Is that, yeah, you understand my question. Yeah. Thank you. No, no, I understand. No, I, I, I get it all the time, right? Um, look, uh, I, I make no bones about it. Look, you can't talk about these issues without dismantling questions of whiteness, right? What is central to what we're talking about, right? So yes, but there, there has to be a way where 
I talk about, for example, everybody has to talk about what is the project of your anti-racist work or your social justice work, right? Uh, I, there comes a moment where I say, well, I want to strengthen uh, my communities, right? To deal with the, the, the violence that they have to encounter every day. But part of that violence is about whiteness. So we need to have that, that kind of, look, settler colonialism, right? It's very, very central to all these issues that we're talking about, right? Uh, uh, the, the question of the land, the question of the architecture, the question of the education, the text and that. So to me, I think, yes, we must pay a gaze on that. And and I wouldn't say that simply when, when you pay that gaze, you are recentering the dominance. No, I think, like you said, we have no choice. We have to do it. But we also have to do it in a way that talks about resistance, that talks about strengthening the, the very communities that are the receiving end or some of the issues that we're talking about and, and that. So it's not an either or, right? It has to be taken uh, to, together, right? When we look at this, look, I do, when you look at, say, our high schools, nobody can tell me that when we look at what goes on in our high schools, that the question of whiteness, right? Both in terms of the knowledge, in terms of the questions of assessment, then in terms of the questions of uh, practices, right? It's not central to, to these discussions. It is, right? It's very central. So to me, it shouldn't be either or. I think we need to put a gaze on that, but also to extend it, to have a strength in our communities, right? To deal and also to think through solutions to their own problems. Thank you, Nana. Is it okay if I ask my second question or do you want me to put my hand down and ask again? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm fine, go ahead. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much, thank you. Uh, the other question, you mentioned accountability. And I, yeah. I see that right now. Uh, you describe exactly what's happening in my institution right now. A lot of performative, vocal yeah. acknowledgement, blah blah. How do we? What 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 measures of accountability? Where should that come from? How could we? I'm struggling mm -hmm. with how to mm -hmm. visualize that, mm -hmm. and and how mm -hmm. how can you make it work? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To me, accountability should be in the eyes of the oppressed communities, right? It should be in the eyes of the oppressed communities. What do they think about the initiatives that have been put in place? How effective has it been, right? So there must be a reporting structure within our institutions that target these communities, right? You, you can't have a policy that is meant to address, right, questions of systemic racism and the violence and not get a feedback from the people who have the receiving end of that, right? So we must have an academic structure in place Right, whereby we look at the target populations and how they see and reflect and assess the initiatives that are being put in place. Right, so to me, I talk about accountability as the community, however we define it. Right, and and, and, and that's the chain that I, I see. But like you said, and as, as I was just saying, there's been a lot of performances around that. Right, so we, where we have all these nice policies, where the question is, yes, we have these nice policies, but what has been the outcome of the policies? What has been the effect of the policies? And somebody has to answer to that, right? Somebody has to answer to that. It's one thing to say we have anti-racism policy. It's not to say our solutions are free from racism, from sexism, and homophobia. One thing, you see, one thing that I say about institutions, and, and I say this at OEZ all the time, right? I'm no longer willing to hear, oh, racism has no place in this institution. I'm not interested in hearing that. What I'm interested in hearing that racism is a problem in this institution, so let's deal with it. That's a different argument altogether. The other one is a nice way of putting it. Oh, racism, anti-Semitism has no place in our institution. Everybody can say that, right? What I want to hear is that it is a problem and this is how we are dealing with it. That's what I want to hear. Yeah, you're talking about erasure and uh, denial in that way. Yeah. Uh, is there any merit to uh, uh, quantitative data that's, that's, you know, like what's- Yeah, what, yeah. I think because of the, the culture of the academy, right, that, the academy puts a lot of weight on figures, right? And I, I've had to deal with that, that. I remember when our study on dropout or push-out came out, right, the Toronto Star would say, well, that study is just student reporting, right? So somehow it wasn't. But then when a study came out that gave percentages, right, they said that's solid research because we do have quantifiable this. It's part of the positivist uh, uh, culture, right? Uh, and it's difficult to break away. But I think, yes, we need to uh, see the nature of the problem and, and deal with that. But I don't think we should put our analysis and dismiss this qualitative research and the qualitative methodology that gives us the structural accounts, the emotional, the deep meanings, the deep effects 
that some of these things are happening on our learners, right? You can't ask people, are you racist or not, right? And 20% said they are not racist. So you say, oh, well, then we are fine, right? No, racism is more than simply a yes or no answer. That can be quantified, right? It's about body language. It's about uh, how you relate and relate to people and that. So to me, it's very, very that. But having said that too, right? I remember um, uh, when there was the issue about collecting race-based stats, right? The question was, well, this statistics could be used in a different way than it was intended because it will give an ammunition, right, to, to somebody to misuse that. And I said, the racists don't need any statistics to back up their comments. They will already have it, right? So you don't need any statistics. So it's, it's not like, oh, this, you get the statistics to address a problem. You want the statistics to address the problem. That's how we should do. So it's not enough simply to say, let's get the quantitative stuff. The question is, what are you going to do with it? That is the question. What are you going to do with it, right? If if you buy statistics, you are just going to put the figures out there and not do anything about. Then you must as well not have collected it, right? So to me, yes, there's a, there's a measure for it. There must be a space for it to establish the nature and the extent of the problem. But to go beyond that, that now that we have established that, we need to do what is expected. In that. Thank you so much, Nana. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Thank I you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I know we have a number of people uh, still waiting to ask a question, and I know our time is limited, so um, I try to get to as many people as we can. Um, I see Caitlin uh, Ellsworth has a question. Hi, yes, thank you, Nana. Um, so you spoke about decolonizing is not just de-westernizing, de but yeah. rather total reassertion of indigenous commitments and you also yeah, then yeah. um I mean communities and then you also spoke about a black radical pedagogy right, so right. what does a black studies program so we're at the university mm -hmm. they're here in conversation about this what does a black studies program add to decolonizing institutions oh a lot a lot a lot, a lot in the sense that we need to have that because there's a lot of misinformation about what blackness is Right, there's a lot of information about that. And so a Black Studies program is a space which allows Black scholarship to be articulated in a way that the learners and the, 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 the instructors, right, conceive a program of Black Studies, right? So there's a lot that it can. And also when I talk about Blackness and indigeneity and radical relationality, right, we need to address that, right? So when you have this a Black Studies program, how does it draw the connections with where we are, right? Uh, and, and that, so that also allowed the space for that to, to, to happen. And then also, I think our learners, right? Our learners need to see that. Our learners need to see that our institutions care, right? Um, look, uh, you know, I always make this joke that in my years, right, I've never seen a center for European studies that is headed by a black scholar, right? But you see a center for African studies that is headed by European white scholar, right? I would expect that when you have a black studies, right, that black scholars, right, are going to be central to that area of study. Yes, of course, you can have other scholars coming, but these black scholars are going to be the drivers of that program. They're going to be the drivers. Let's make no two ways about it. I don't see how you can have an indigenous studies program and non-indigenous people are the drivers of it, right? So we shouldn't expect that. If you're going to have a black studies program, black scholars will have to be the drivers. But it doesn't mean they are exclusionary, right? They can have room for people who operate with that also to come in. But the drivers of that is going to be that, right? And that. Uh, but I think, yes, I think other learners need to know about black studies because there's a lot of misinformation about black studies, right? That needs to be addressed in that context. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. And I think we have time for one more question. Oh. <laughs> time is just escaping us today. Uh, Bismarck, if you have a question, please. Um, this is your opportunity to ask uh, Nana. Oh, but you're on mute, Bismarck. All right. Thank you very much again, Nana and Mariam and 
uh, Professor Beckford and your team. Uh, I'm, I was actually talking about how bold you tackle the issues of um, um, racism and decolonization and everything. I think that is what we need, being mm. bold and talking as they are not trying to hide things. But I, I'm very much particular about the issues of um, learning about colonialism because I was privileged to uh, have uh, the Ghanaian system and then the Canadian system. Now, if you look at the Ghanaian system of education, although we are teaching about issues of anti-colonialism, you still find traits mm -hmm. of colonialism embedded in the educational system. Take, for instance, the legal education in Ghana, which is labeled along the colonial system. And we talk about um, the colonization or anti-colonialism. Where lies the anti-colonialism we're talking about? And also, when you look at the teaching practices in Ghana, everything is labeled or you talked about measurement and evaluation. Everything is about bookish. Yeah. Uh, I think since you were in Ghana, you, you recently probably followed the National Science and Math Quiz, which offers children or students the opportunity to sit down, be asked questions, and then provide answers to it. What about the issues of uh, putting them into practice? You go to a very prestigious technological uh, university in Ghana, and they are importing technologies from outside. What are we doing about it? And we have a line in the Ghanaian national anthem, which uh, says, and help us to resist oppressors rule. But yeah. then you look at pseudo uh, decolonization we talked about and then our governments go hand in hand begging and they are giving conditionalities before you are giving this aid follow our ways of doing things what happened yeah. to in, in our system so nana don't you think we need to look at how our whole educational system is structured because i feel we need mm -hmm. to hold champion the course of decolonization and um, uh, anti-colonialism right from the roots, even yeah. because you must, we cannot go on with um, yeah. an emphasis on Western scholarship alone. Yeah. You must champion people like yeah. yourself, Abekfor, Dr. Allen, and the other people I may not have known about. Don't you think we need to champion them, the roots mm -hmm. of this? And yeah. I think that would help voting people like myself as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, thanks for your question. I, I think you're right. Look, a couple of things here. One is Decolonization is a global struggle, right? Decolonization. And the reason why decolonization is a global struggle is because coloniality knows no borders. It knows no boundaries, right? And like we said, like we, we have post-colonial education in, in Ghana or in other parts of Africa, but is it really post-colonial? Is it really post-colonial, right? I talked about in my own growing up, right? I learned more about Naga Falls, the rivers in Canada than the the local rivers in my own village, right? I hardly knew about them, but I knew about Naga Falls and all that. If you still deal with that. So Ghana is going through that. It's, it's a thing for us, it's going through that. Then there's also a question of indigeneity, right? We are our own harshest critics, right? When you talk about African indigeneity, somebody will ask you, what is that? And you talk about modernity. I see, look, I see, we, we, look, so, and that modernity is conceptualized as Western modernity. When we need to talk about that indigenous modernity, because when we talk about the African indigeneity, it's not stuck and boxed in place. It also moves with the times, right? So we need to talk about that, right? So, and, again, and this is, again, the problem of colonial education. The way it has, right, seeped through our entire system, right, to generate a particular body that reads the world from a different lens. And, and, and that, that, that is the issue. I have agreed, and Melifi Asanji has also made that point, and I know my friend Andrew also made that point, that to me, right, there are no African universities. There are no African universities. What we have are universities in Africa. That's what we have. We have universities in Africa, but there are no African universities because the, the, the universities in Africa are simply following that internationalization. The Western standards, and that's what they are, they are, they are. And like Nyerere would say, they're doing a catch up, right? That's what, that's, that's what, and that has been a problem, right? We need to Africanize, we need to indigenize, and we need to do that. And this is where these questions become very, very important, right? We, these questions become very, very important. This is why, for example, we need to talk about how do we promote African centered perspectives, right? We have learners, right? Who don't even, they mimic theories that hardly speak to their own realities. 
just because the academy expects them to perform, right? So they will mimic all those things, but they will hardly mimic or they will hardly use, right, works by our own scholars that also propagate very powerful ideas to work with. And I think there's something that we, we, need, we, need, to, we, need, we, we need to address in our education system. We need to address. So it's a global issue. It's a global phenomenon. It's not just here. Right? It's something which is global, and we need to, to, to do with it. And like you said, to me, one of the things I've said, like young learners like you coming up, right? There's a particular charge, and this is to pioneer new analytical systems for understanding our communities that are steeped in our own homegrown cultural perspectives. It's like how the Maori, the Maori are doing, right? The Maori, the indigenous people, right? They, they're looking at their own concept, their own ideas. And so, I mean, African black scholars like yourself, we even need that, right, to, to be, and, and that's why to me, it's not just simply the de-Westernization, it's also comes to mind in terms of a particular frame of mind, developing that frame of mind, a very, very different frame of mind that asks different questions. Right? Decolonization begins by asking different questions. So what new conversations can we begin to have, right, when we ask new questions? We will have different conversations when we are allowed to ask new questions. Thank you, Bismarck, for that. And Nana, thank you again. Um, I, I think it's safe to say on behalf of everyone here that uh, we, we are just full right now. Um, and, and I invite the team to turn their, their cameras back on our, our team um, that was here this morning. But I just want to uh, thank everyone uh, for joining us on this inaugural session of the uh, Distinguished uh, uh, Speaker Series, Race, Indigeneity, and Anti-Colonial Education, Making the Discursive Links. Uh, Nana, this was just a, an amazing opportunity for all of us. So we just thank you for your presence and in sharing this space with us, this virtual space with us today, everyone and sharing your knowledge and research as well as we you know continue along this journey at disrupting and dismantling colonialist practices in our institutions and in our daily lives so um yes just thank you is not a, a big enough word uh we are better for having spent this time with you uh today so thank you thank you thank you no, thanks you all for, for having me i enjoyed this I'm, I'm sorry if i spoke too long but just so you know, um, your um, uh, Bismarck, um, who just asked you um, that question, can you tell he's um, Ghanaian, um, uh -huh. but also defending his MED thesis at 12 o'clock, which is in a minute. So um, I, I thought that would be a uh, uh -huh. be pleased to hear that. Um, Dr. Arlene, our next. Um, um, uh, speaker is is in January. I don't know if you want to say um, a little bit about that in the next half a minute or so. Yeah, just very, very briefly. Um, I spoke to Akua Benjamin this week and uh, she uh, has agreed to be our next speaker on January 14th. I think it is, it's a Friday at 10 a.m. And uh, so I, I'm, we're all excited. So mm -hmm. more information to follow. And uh, but we wanted to everyone to know before you go off for the the, the holiday break that Akua Benjamin, um, formerly at Ryerson, um, what's her ex university formerly also formerly at Ryerson, um, mm -hmm. will be speaking. So. Yeah. yeah, and thank you, Prof. And just so you know, we are going to take you up on your offer um, to visit your village. In yes, Africa. yes. No. <laughs> okay. How was how was the internet? Um, did, was there any breaks in it? No, it was great. Oh, was okay, great. okay, okay. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Joanna and uh, your team. Um, thanks, Miriam and Aisha. And thank you, everyone who came out um, 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 today. Uh, thank you so much um, for, um, for being here. Thank, thank you, you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.